we on? Are we live? Hey. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Thanks for getting up so early in the morning. Congratulations on getting a seat. In about 10 minutes, there will be no seats left. That's my theory. Let's get it started. Come on in for the cage match. Round one about to begin. 13 rounds of mayhem. Previously undefeated. Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Okay. <laughs> so we got Big Blue, Chuck Severance here in this corner, representing the University of Michigan. And I'll represent Big Red in Indiana. I mean, Hoosier is in the audience here with us today. Who are you, right? All you Any more friends in the audience? No blue. Yay. No blue. Oh, no. Oh, no. We got blue people. We got some. Uh, we got big game Saturday, don't we? Big game coming up at Michigan. <clears throat> There. Tell them about the cards. Oh, you got cards. Blue cards and red cards. At the end of each round, you're going to hold the card for the winner of that round. Red card or blue card. Michigan people or Indiana. Those of you who got Indiana fans, you know who to vote for. Okay. You didn't get one, there's more up here. And the person who wins punches the other person with a boxing glove. <laughs> so the stakes are important. We do so have headgear, so we are ready to do this round. And Kurt, Kurt's headgear messes his hair up a lot worse than my head. <laughs> so it's one of the downsides of having hair. Okay. Should we get started? There's going to be uh, rules. Are there any other rules? A uh, few rules. You're going to have to run out of the aisle, you know, because you're going to pick the topic we're going to talk about in round one and round two. Round three, you're going to pick the topics yourself. We don't have a round three topic pick, so you're going to write them on your cards and call up. So round one and two, there are topics, 20 topics. We're going to do one minute for each topic as a debate. It works out. We have a cage match. Yeah. This one works better. All right. So we got blue versus red. This is the way we looked like last week. Actually, this is the way we looked like as teenagers. I found this picture of Chuck online. That's shot quite a, quite a while ago there. That was when I was in Mr. Cotta's classroom. <laughs> <laughs> and then you give a gangster. But uh, we got all you and Wolverines round one. Okay. Now, you have to be in hooking stance once in a while when you do this stuff. So I didn't bring my hooking stance glasses, so you know, you can uh, put them on and put your headgear on and all sorts of things and get ready for your MOOC and talk to your students and so forth, right? <laughs> well, you've got your MOOCing stance uh, glasses, okay, well, round one. These are the ten topics of round one. I'm going to just read through the list and then I'm going to go number one, number two, and you're going to yell which one you want. 90% drops, a la exercise bikes. I'm in love with stickers. The death of OER. Disruption or sputtering. The end of MOOCs. The end of days. C MOOCs and X MOOCs. The for profit professor, Dr. Chuck Online. Fly by office hours. Locating the Gardner Hype Cycle. MOOC troll, uh, stalkers and trolls. And MOOC to degree versus MOOC as plug in. Okay? We're going to now go through the list. You're going to ask for an item. I'm going to hear it. I'm going to yell through here. Number one, number two, number three, number four. Number five. Gotta yell the number you want. Number five. What? startup companies. You want to know, right? You want to know where we're How many of you are, are in the news media? How many of you have a blog that does a hype moose? Talk about the Gardner Hype Cycle, Chuck. Well, so, so the thing that I observe right away, having done a lot of these things, and when you have gray hair, you realize that the Gardner Hype Cycle applies to every single thing on this planet, right? And we are in the up phase of the Gardner Hype Cycle of the MOOCs, and so everything seems great, right? Every MOOC is better than the previous MOOC, and every, every new op opportunity is great, but we are going to hit this Gardner Hype Cycle, and I don't know when it is, and I, I think the interesting question for anything like a MOOC is what it does when the Gardner Hype Cycle sort of bottoms out, and then who picks it back up, right? It's, it's not the people that push it up to the top, it's who picks it back up when it's hit the bottom. So, I agree with Chuck. Let's go back to, to, the, to the start. What was the second one they picked? Number five. Number five. C MOOCs and X MOOCs. Any C MOOC people in the audience here? Any connectivist Kool-Aid drinkers in the audience? Any Canadians? <laughs> they can leave now. Uh, <laughs> C MOOCs and X MOOCs. But Michigan's kind of in. It, 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 and I grew up in Wisconsin, where, you know. Yeah, both of us are almost. Betcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
So I'll start, and then you can yeah, sure. yeah. like around. So, so basically, what I what worries me about the connectivist MOOC debate, and George Siemens has given a talk in another room, and so I wish he was here to sort of like throw something at least. Good, he's not here, so we can talk all about George. Exactly, he can't respond, so I'll make him respond later in the blog. That's <laughs> critical of MOOCs in general. Um, but the problem is, I think there's a conflation of pedagogy and the fact that we have a large class, right? And so the notion that somehow uh, the fact that we're going to make a large class means that we must adopt a certain pedagogy. And so I think that the connectivist pedagogy is a great pedagogy, but it's just one of so many different pedagogies. And so to, I, I wish we'd stop using the word C, MOOC, and X, MOOC, and understand that MOOC is just something that's big with open enrollment. We'll get to open education resources in a bit, but it's big and it's open enrollment and it's a course. And we're going to use lots and lots of pedagogy. And I'm going to hand it to you because you're missing pedagogy. Well, you know, there are many things you can do to enhance the engagement in your class. How many of you were with us yesterday in Cengage's event, you know? Uh, as you saw, dozens and dozens of things you can do. Connectivism, social media, interactivity through Twitter and through Facebook or whatever. It, it's, it's vital, it's useful and so forth, but it will not be the only thing that you rely on to have a successful loop. If, you're, if your goal is objectives of learning basic facts in math, in algebra, in geography, or whatever it happens to be, there are some places for computer-based uh, drill activities, flashcard activities, you're learning a language. Social media can enhance that. Discussions in live mocha or Chinese bot, whatever you might be using to learn a language, are helpful. Okay, let's go back to the beginning list. We're going to start the clock, but I just figured I'd the belly you mentioned. Number one, number two, number three, number four. One, 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 one. let's go to one. Ninety percent drops. What do you think? You got you had. I have your data here. You had a lot of people drop in your moon, but a lot of people survive. Tell us about the, the, the moon. And what do you think here? Is well, I think that the conversation about ninety percent drops just in the last couple of weeks actually is starting to be the right conversation, and that's what this, this stop is. right there. This picture is from the conversation. You didn't realize that. In Australia, there's a new online journal called The Conversation. They're talking about books. It's free. In Canada, the silly Canadians have the evolution with three L's in it. Keep going. So the problem is, is what's the denominator? And we're finally getting to have a really good debate about the, what the denominator is. And the problem goes back to the Gardner Hype Cycle, and that is when you are trying to convince every human in the world that this is the most important thing on the planet, you cite large numbers, like 100,000. I spend a lot of time saying, oh, I taught 56,000, I taught 56,000, to build myself up as something super awesome. But in, re in reality, um, I really only like taught 14,000 because those people showed up in the first day of class. And so the denominator's wrong, and I think we're going to find completion rates in the 30 to 50 to 60 percent range in the long term if we get the denominator right. Lives are changing. Lives are changing. So when we look at this data, some people are there just to find out if they're interested in the topic or not, right? And so that, those are drops. Those we want we want actually the dropout rate to be higher. That indicates people are interested in the topic. The higher the dropout rate that the press is reporting, the better, not the worse. These are people, that, this is the learning century. That means everyone's going to be learning something all the time. The higher the number of people dipping their toes in the water to think about getting a new degree or certificate, the better. So these, these numbers are silly, the media, those media people in the audience, these numbers are silly. Okay, number two, number three, number four. Ten. 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 Ooh, we Ten. Ten. Okay. All right. I started two of those first. Dipping your toes in the water is one type of MOOC, basically a lost leader MOOC. And when people ask me what type of MOOCs I think are the most viable are professional development MOOCs, lost leader MOOCs is another. Mine was a reusable MOOC. I did it with Blackboard. We had 4,000 people. He had 10 times. He had 40,000 in his MOOC. And he's still really? 10,000. Let's get it okay. So I believe that, that MOOC to degree is, a, is an important announcement in Dallas, Texas uh, last month. They're, they got 20 universities, 24, that banded together and said, we're going to offer one free class to get you interested in a master's degree. I'll call that a lost leader. Chuck and the guy is going to disagree with me a bit. So let's hear what Chuck has to say. Well, I think I, I'm an academic, and I've always been an academic. When I write software, it's open source and it's free, and somehow I seem to feed my family somehow. And so I'm not really a startup guy. I would have been a startup guy a long time ago. And so it's sort of, I, I get sort of these kind of creepy feelings. That was your comment. Um, I get these creepy feelings every one of the time someone sort of tries to put up a really snazzy graphics page and a whole bunch of stuff and like, they're trying to get in early but I'm not sure what value they're really adding. So I mean I think Coursera's had a tremendous value in, 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 in teaching the world and making this, this aware to people but when I move to degree it just feels to me like they're sort of like 
sneaking in and trying to be the first people to make a ton of money. Yeah, so is the notion of being making money, or are you really helping people out and helping them change their lives and their career? And that's why I think we have to think about how are we changing people's lives, right? Okay, number two, number three, number four, number six, six, number six, 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 six. I love six. Uh, I thought you'd love six. Yeah. So. So yeah, you start the this time. So, so here's the thing, right? I mean. We're all wondering how the MOOC companies are going to make money. I'm also wondering sort of how the professors are going to really benefit from this. And I'm, I'm on my third MOOC now, two with Coursera, and one that I put up my own thing, online.drchuck.com. So the story of online.drchuck.com was I saw online.stanford.edu, and it was awesome, right? I went to online.stanford.edu, it was awesome, open source, awesome, doing it right. And then I went back to the University of Michigan and said, let's make one of these things. And they go, wow, we're not ready to do that. So I go to my dean. I say, let's make one for our school of information. They said, I'm not ready to do that. I said, well, damn it, I'm going to make one called online.drtruck.com. If you don't want me to put my courses in your market, then I will put them in my own market. And then I will be in the curriculum committee. And I will be the dean of the drtruck.com university. And so I think as we get open source things like class to go that allow these things to pop up all over the place, they're going to pop up over the place. And people are not going to wait until they're invited into something like Coursera. It's a great honor to be part of Coursera. And I love being part of Coursera. Are you going to interrupt me? OK, I love being part of Coursera. And, um, but at the same time, it, for me, it's too slow. It's not innovating fast enough. And I want to work on open source. I want to control my own operation. I want to put every course that I've ever taught up as a MOOC and teach it to, yeah, so I, Dr. Chuck Online, my first class only had 1,300 students. So I don't have 100,000. But it's OK. They're all over the place. I think we need to move on. You get Daniel Pink's book, The Cell is Human, right? There's a great line between over-promoting yourself and being unassuming and humble as faculty are told to be, right? We're the human are the humble. <laughs> yeah, we are yeah, yeah, the humble unassuming types. All right, number two, number three, number four, number seven, number nine. Seven, I heard. This is also Dr. Chuck. <laughs> Dr. Chuck, he flew to Manila. He flew to Seoul. He flew. Barcelona and those students. He's a little Philippines. He's a crazy man. How many of you oh, would yeah. like to fly you to Barcelona and meet a crazy man? Right? Okay, you're okay. a crazy traveling guy. Okay, you're a crazy traveler. Tell them how you were able to, and okay. you drove your car, right? All around the U.S. And yeah, I actually did. took my son on a road trip. By a motorcycle? No, no, I didn't motorcycle. So, um, so, that, so let me give you the pedagogy behind this, because I think that's important. And that is, in these large classes, there is a sense of loneliness and a sense of non-community. And, and for me, this is about building community. And that is, if you meet face to face with a fraction of your students, and then you record it and you publish it, then the students understand that I'm a human being, and that I care, and I care enough to see some students. And yeah, I didn't see all 20,000 of them in my class, but I've seen some of them, and I publish it. And it really creates a sense of community. And what I'm learning is, in the second time I'm teaching the same class, I can reuse the video. So it's going to be by the time I'm done with this third or fourth time, I'm going to have office hours from all over the planet, which I think is going to naturally create a community that, that students are going to feel very empowered and very part of this class, that these are humans. Both I'm a human and the fellow students are humans. I think these Michigan people are making way too much money. You know, I have my office hours in Google Hangouts. I don't know about you guys, but I can't fly to Barcelona to meet my students. I have watched faculty in Google Hangouts doing <laughs> office hours, and they look to me like they're in prison. They don't look happy. <laughs> 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 My office hours are fun. No, we're drinking coffee, we're talking philosophy of life, it's what office hours should be. And you're like sitting there with a camera, it's like, oh, is this thing over yet? Oh, man. Oh, man. That's crap. Blah, blah, blah. You haven't been to mine then. Okay, okay. I guess I haven't been to mine. Come on. How many of you have office hours in Google Hangouts? Adobe Connect? Blackboard Illuminate? Nah. Okay, let's go back to the list here. And he's got videos of all these office hours, by the way. You can watch Dr. Chuck. We got number two, number three, number four, number nine. Four. 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 Disruption or sputtering, the end of MOOCs. The end is new. Yeah, you know, we got this Virginia Tech MOOC, right, that kind of got suspended because they, you know, had a little problem with Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, right? Get your southern states right. Well, so what happened, right? They, they tried something. They took a risk. I see nothing wrong with that. You know, got the guy in Irvine that was trying to sell his books for 80 bucks. Eh, you know, then, then found people weren't buying his book. But two problems that have come up in the past couple of weeks out of hundreds of MOOCs, I would have expected about you know, 50 to 100 problems. In fact, there's only two. You know, there's, there's no sputtering here. There's no end of MOOCs here at all. In fact, I think we need to, we need to have more failures so we can learn from them. I, I think there's been cover-ups, actually, of what's been going on. 
Uh, we had problems the first week of our MOOC. We had people trying to sabotage us. We were using Blackboard, uh, and some people just don't like Blackboard for whatever reason. We had some trolls out there. We can get back to that. What do you yeah, think? I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I think that transparency is an important part of this, and I think that we learned a lot from the, the Georgia Tech uh, episode. I think it was a technology problem, um, and I think she'll be back, and I think she'll be fine. And I think that I, think that I completely agree with that we, we have to have failures, and we have to be transparent about those failures. Because at the end of the day, what we are doing is the first time in 2,000 years, we are taking some of the best faculty in the world and we're letting them watch each other's sausage being made, right? When's the last time you flew a thousand miles and sat in the back of somebody's small group interaction? But you can do that now. Hundreds of faculty, we're putting our best out there and we're going to learn from each other. And this is unprecedented in the history of education. And looking at each other's teaching is the thing that's going to transform us, including the failures. Uh, and she's asking okay, to help her with the remote, so I'm going to be helping in that Georgia Tech one, so I should have got it right. Number two, number three, number nine. 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 I like nine. I've been waiting for nine. <laughs> then take at it. Okay. Here you start the time. So, so <clears throat> this is sort of a journalist rant, right, where we've got these people that write blogs, and I think they're being paid to write these blogs, and I think they kind of have something they have to write every week. So if they have to write something every week, and it's Thursday, and they don't have anything interesting to say, then they have to, they just trot out some negative moke post, right? Because they gotta do something by the weekend, or they're not gonna get their money. So this is where we create lots of vacuous moot things. And so what they'll do is they'll like register for a moot, and then they'll like, like find themselves too busy, and then they'll drop out, and then they'll write a, a scathing thing about like their own experience in the MOOC, and the MOOCs are terrible, and I dropped out, and so that means the whole thing's a bad idea. And it's like, those are trolls, right? They're just waiting. They're, they, they make up their mind it is a failure before they walk in. They've got to write an article, and so they come into the class, and then they drop out, and then they make a big deal about it, and it like gets repeated a million times over and over like a drug. Who's tired of the media talking about the positives or the negatives and nothing in between, right? It's, it's kind I'm of... I'm tired of talking about the negatives. I'm not tired of talking about the positives, though. We got two left. Number two or number three? Two. 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 All right, Chuck, you've got your stickers. Anybody, you else, anybody in my class? Anybody who took my class? Took Chuck's class. In industry here. technology? Okay, got stickers for you. Come on up after the thing if you had not get a sticker. Come on there. Give us, okay. Who would like some stickers? Chuck's got from his, from his move. He's going to give some stickers out. Who took my move, by the way? Yeah, you heard doesn't have any stickers. I don't have any. I don't have any silly stickers. So, so here we go. So, so the stickers again are like the office hours, and they produce a physical artifact, right? They produce a physical artifact that pulls us out of the virtual, no matter how far you are away. I do have in the back of my office a giant box full of I'm signing certificates. That's one of the things I do in my office hours. I sign certificates. I have certificates all over the world, lots of a lot of hundreds of certificates that people sent me for me to send back. I just had the time to open them and then sign them. But I love turning the virtual into the physical because then it touches us as human beings. It's a, if it's all virtual, it's it's not real to me. But but Chuck, this notion of stickers indicates connectivism doesn't work. Well, no, I'm not saying that. It indicates that connectivism is not the only thing. Behavioral theory still works. People want to, adults come to meet you in Barcelona to get their sticker. They do. You know, 50 year old people want a sticker. They want this money. I got another couple million cash around this side of the room. You know, people want tangible things, certificates, money, stickers. We have to be eclectic when we teach in online environments using cognitive theory, using social learning theory, using behavioral theory. All they combine together to create learning environments. I think we have to stop the debates about what theory is best and start thinking about what's best for our students and also what's best for us as instructors. Well, how, how we get rejuvenated in our teaching. Try some new things out. Um, don't be stuck with one mode, in, in effect. We have one topic left. We can sneak up to the next 10. Maybe we should just skip the death of OER. What do you think? Just keep oh, going. no, that's a good should, one. We should, that go, is a good one. we should go to death of OER. Why don't you take over and I'll pass around some millions on this side of the room for people whose budgets are low. So, um, so go ahead, Chuck. Okay, so there's a, there's a group of people that, that are really anger, angry at the current purveyors of moves, like Orsera, Udacity, and edX, that they are not obsessed with OER. And this is insane as far as I'm concerned, right? That's like saying Moodle is not obsessed with OER. They are creating technology, they are creating brand, and they are putting, giving us ways to talk to each other. 
And OER is really my job as a faculty member. It is not Coursera's job to tell me, I mean, it's no different than the connectivism, right? It says you can't have a MOOC unless it's connectivist. Well, maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. To say you can't have a MOOC unless it's OER, that's, that's neither right nor wrong. We faculty need to be encouraged, and we need to continue the move towards open education resources. Now, what's interesting is that anybody who teaches a course that's not using open education resources, they tend to get nicked by their students. So there's sort of this like a Pavlovian positive negative response that you get. If you do a course and you use OER, you give your materials away, then the students love you, and if you don't, they don't love you as much as they did before. So I think, it's, I think we're gonna see the students gently moving MOOCs towards that, but I think it is totally unfair to expect Coursera or Udacity or edX to say it's gotta be open education resources. That's just, that's just crazy. Another slant on this question is, are MOOCs bigger than OER, or is OER bigger than MOOCs? And I think open education is a bigger entity. The world's become open, my book over there, we're gonna give away the best question. The world's become open for learning. MOOCs are a trend within that openness. E-books is a trend within that openness. Open access articles is a trend within that openness. E-learning and blended learning is a trend within that openness. Uh, participatory learning with Wikipedia and YouTube is a trend within that. MOOCs are not it. There are many other things that are happening simultaneously to transform and revolutionize education. Okay. It's voting time. It is voting time, so let's put go. Your helmet on. I'll put my helmet on. Gotta find your little, little things, your little cards. <coughs> okay. Let's see who can hit each other the softest. <laughs> you go first. Okay. Red cards, blue cards. Hold up. Who won round one? Red cards or blue cards? Holy crap! I can't believe that I got you, Kurt. That's awesome. <laughs> I would have never believed that I would have won against Kurt Braun. Okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm leaving. Stop. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> and that, oh, crap. And that's after giving people pens and million dollar bills. You still won. I like the stickers, you see. I get the stickers. What are you doing? I get my. You see my. <laughs> because he won a roll round one. Look at this guy. I'm just getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? You know? Uh-oh. <laughs> you have a tattoo? Do you have a tattoo? I do. Can you show yours? Can you show us your tattoo? And there's, of course, a tattoo. So we are going to... <laughs> I have a tattoo. This is awesome. You didn't know I had a tattoo. <laughs> it's close to my awesome. research. I think about my research. Okay. Let's see if I can get this shirt off. It's been a long time since I've music my for this. Is there any, do any, you don't probably have music for this, right? No, no, no. Dun, 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 Yelp for MOOCs. MOOCs spontaneously combusting. Want some MOOC with your TV dinner? Remedial MOOCs or PD MOOCs. Panic or hysteria. One billion learners served. EDX by 2023. All right, need the audience participation again. Number one, number two. Five, 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 five this, so, so the, I was a little, uh, the startups always make me creepy, but these registries, right, these are awesome. I mean, this stuff is popping up everywhere, thanks to Stanford's class to go. That's like the 40th time I've said Stanford's class to go. Thanks to Stanford's class to go, Moodle, Sakai, other open sources. People are just knocking these MOOCs out there, not waiting. 
And so what happens is they gotta find him. And so I did this Python MOOC starting in January and my own thing, online.drchuck.com, no marketing, I didn't have a Super Bowl ad or nothing. And like somebody found me through a MOOC registry. Like who are these people making these free MOOC registries? And they have starting times and they haven't got to the point of reviews yet, but this is gonna be awesome, right? Imagine what Google does when you start looking for hotels in Austin, right? Up come some reviews and up come all these things. And there, I think that there is a tremendous opportunity to build paths through MOOCs, right? That's the thing I think none of us are figuring out how to do yet, and that's what the path through MOOCs are. So students who took this class really did well in this class afterwards. Students who did this, it's the Amazon, yeah. I agree. Let's go on to the next <laughs> No, I think I was building stuff for uh, collaboration and sharing on the web about eight different share sites back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, and the Yelp for Degrees idea is that's just an evolution of things that we were building back then, and it makes a lot of sense. We have personalized the learning, we have to find out what others feel about the topic, we want to get some feedback about how the quality of the course is. We want to know if we're making a risky investment of time or not by engaging in that activity. It's a significant chunk of time. Even though it's free, time is money for people. And so Yelp for Degrees makes a lot of sense because it's you know, I'll buy audiobooks, I'll buy the physical books. The money really doesn't matter. It's my time investment in listening to the book in my car or in taking a book and listening to it on a podcast show or whatever. That's what matters to me more so than the money itself. So, you know, they could, they could sell these books for 100 bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks. I would still take them as long as I had the time to do it. But anyhow, number one, number two, number three. Number one, three. Ten. I heard ten. I heard one. I heard one. So let's go to one. Let's go to one first. Okay, Chuck. You did a silly thing. And these Michigan people are silly all the time. You know what he did? When I taught my book, I had a blackboard sponsoring behind me and helping me out. He did his book and he's like, I think I'm going to try peer grading. And then he gets to the press, the crowd will eat them up, you know? And I'm down there in Indiana and say, let that Michigan guy go, you know? What happened, Chuck? Well, first off, I, I am happy to be it, right? So Coursera says to me, about the signature track and they're looking for people to volunteer the signature track and I'm like, yes, I mean, I'm the guinea pig. I, I can take it, right? I can take it, get it. I can make a mistake, I'm open enough, I'm cocky enough that if I make a mistake, I just pop back up and keep going. He's cocky. Sure. So, um, so basically, peer grading was something I wanted to do right away. Now, it turned out to be a mistake in my course because my Internet History, Technology, and Security course, the course with the stickers, um, is really intended to be a freshman course, but I wanted to really push the notion of people from all over the planet being able to take this. And peer grading, at least in writing assignments, is really kind of brutal for non-English speakers, especially when you end up with the plagiarism debate. And then you have, have these people, and in my class we had people ranging from 15 years old to PhDs, and some of them are like English teachers. And when an English teacher peer grades somebody from Pakistan's assignment, it's not going to be pretty, right? And so what happens is, and, and, and especially if that Pakistan person put a couple of sentences from Wikipedia in, I mean, they're going to fly to Pakistan and punch that person, basically, right? <laughs> and, so, and so what happens is, is it achieves something. I wanted conversation, peer grading to become conversation. Um, and it didn't. It became kind of like this violent clash of cultures that I did unintended. So I quickly made all the rest of peer grading in my class optional. And it turned out to be wonderful at that point. And that's the key of any pedagogy, right? There's no right or no, no wrong answer. My class was not a writing class. So what I did was about 10% of the people that did peer grading extra credit, and they were the people that wanted to talk and talk, and all the graders were good, and the writing was good, and everybody had a great time. And the 90% that were afraid to jump into that little washing machine of peer grading, they could just take the quizzes and do fine on the test. But that depends on the class. Yeah, in my class, I have eight TAs helping out give feedback. Students want feedback on everything they post. Uh, but we did this at the last minute. We made a mistake. He made a mistake maybe in some ways of peer grading. My mistake was not getting the planning on the front end. We, Blackboard twisted my arm kind of late. It was last year at this conference, they were twisting my arm to do a, a MOOC that started in May. And uh, I got TAs to help out and give feedback at the last minute, like the last week. And the first introductions, all students need feedback when they introduce themselves into the MOOC and, and welcome them in. That's the mistake we made. Now let's go back to the round here. We yeah. have number, number 10, that's right, 10. One billion, one billion learners, sir. You know, uh, how ridiculous does that sound, especially from people who haven't served up much of anything yet, uh, but we'll, we'll wait and see. Okay, are we changing lives when we talk about a billion people being served through one entity called EDX? or Coursera or whatever, or uh, what's going to happen here? What do you think? 
So I think maybe the billion number is a little overinflated, but I, I don't think that we're going to see small numbers. I think that the numbers are going to grow, and I think that uh, this, this leads toward a business model. And if you look at the Coursera website, the one thing the Coursera website has when it first comes up, it gives you the number of Coursereans. <coughs> and that tells you something about what's important, right? So there's 2.4 million and one and one and two and three. So these things to survive need large user bases. Any startup needs to grow its users first. Not grow its revenue first, but grow its users first. So let's say Coursera ends up with five million people that are actively using it. If each one they can extract only a mere twenty dollars, they're a hundred million dollars a year. You can sustain quite an operation on a hundred million dollars a year. And so you, the, the size is the key to sustainability for these things, so that they don't, like the University of Michigan, we have 23,000 students, and it costs $2 billion a year to run my university. You kind of figure out how much we got to take from these students, right? But if Coursera can have 5 million students and take $20 for each student, then they can sustain, as long as they don't foolishly like buy the Coursera private jet or you know sponsor the America's Cup yacht race or something stupid like that. But as long as they keep it's themselves just picnics right now, you know, picnics are cheap, right? And so as long as they keep it to the point where they they only have you know 25 to 40 people and they can afford it and they don't overgrow, the sustainability has to do with that number. And so I think that I I like the thought. I think Billy is the top. All right, go back to the yeah. sets here. Number two, number three, number four, two, two. Well, here we go. You know, how many of y'all there believe that the common package is moved? I'm curious. Raise your hands. Oh, it's so it's going back to the, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The Khan Academy helps K-12 schools think about the viability of moves, right? The Khan Academy gets parents at home to talk to their kids about online learning that maybe later will be dipping their own toes in the water and taking a boot. The Khan Academy is an exposure thing. It's familiarity. And we all know the first phase is familiarity, then resistance, and then understanding and use. And so while the Khan Academy is not a boot in the, in the sense of a massive open online class that we're taking synchronously together in stream, it is an asynchronous form of MOOC of some kind. I mean, we were doing MOOCs with radio and TV decades ago. Uh, and you know, so we've got leadership here. It's quasi MOOC, but it's not a MOOC. Yeah, I, mean, I think it, it's no question. Khan Academy paved the way for MOOC. I think the the the, the part that I don't like about Khan Academy um, is the notion that somehow, like one person or a small set of people, are going to do all the curriculum from history to social science to algebra to calculus to physics to public policy. And I think the notion of calling it Khan Academy. Of course, Dr. Chuck online is Dr. Chuck online, but um, I'm only going to teach those courses that I'm uniquely skilled at, that I've written the book for, or I did something. I'm not going to try to teach a bunch of history courses or social science courses or cognitive psychology courses. Dr. Chuck online is going to be a boutique place, and I think Khan Academy mistakenly tried to solve too much, right? Um, but I do think that they absolutely paved the way for MOOCs, and I think then what we're going to see is that there are certain things that Khan Academy does give, and that is a roadmap for its learners that move people down a path to some greater achievement than any individual thing. We're going to have to do that in MOOCs as well. So I think we're going to take repeated, I think Khan Academy itself is not so much a MOOC, but I think MOOCs need to take more inspiration from Khan Academy as we go forward. Number nine, number eight, number seven, number six, number four, or number three? Three. Three, a lot of threes. Business plans, business plans, business plans. Do you think it's an ethical issue here when people are selling your data, like Facebook wanted to sell your data? What are the MOOCs out there? What are, what are the business plans out there? Business plans include paying to sign up, paying for grading, paying for a certificate. You might have a business plan where a sponsor happens, a corporate sponsor might be paying for the MOOC. They might pay for the data. They might pay for the best test takers, and you get 20% uh, of the first year's salary, or 10% of the first year's salary. You might pay incrementally, like the University of Washington, where you have a free course, a web enhanced course, and a full-on university credit course. There are many business plans out there today. This is one of them. I don't like this particular one myself. I think there are better ones like paying for assessments and paying for certificates and things of that nature. I like this one, okay? Um, and because they're not typically giving employers to access to student data unless the students release the data, right? It's going to be student driven. If they were going to give employers access to student data without asking the student, yeah, that would be like a big down. Okay. And, uh, and so, look at this timer right here. Chuck sent me a uh, link to download the timer. 
I downloaded the fire and checked the silly box that they could get my data. They also sent me a virus or two, by the way, Chuck. Okay. I did get two viruses. Your glass is half full and my glass is half full. My glass is half full. Your glass is half full. So you can be silly and check these data and all of a sudden you're getting all these, you know, people soliciting your, you know, feedback on things. You didn't mean to do that. Anyhow, yeah, let's, you, you probably read it now. All right, let's go back to the top here. Number nine, number eight, number seven, number six, number four. 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 Pity party for professors in the conversation. Chuck, you want to take the first step? Yeah, I'm a professor and I'm scared every day. I should be scared every day. We live a wonderful life. We should not believe that this privilege is ours forever and ever and ever. We should wake up and work hard every single day. And if this MOOC stuff makes me scared or makes my colleagues scared, then I think it's a natural thing. If this MOOC makes administrators scared, great. Do I think people who are scared and then react to that fear by doing clever things, are they going to be out of a job? Absolutely not. People who sit and bury their heads and perhaps don't put an online program like uh, just random schools, yeah. schools in the Midwest that aren't getting into the MOOCs, right? I think that they're burying their heads and they're saying, I'm afraid, right? And I'm afraid of the funds, I'm afraid. So the fear is a good thing as long as the fear moves you towards changing. I honestly think that we're going to see a revolution in the top 25 schools in the next 20 years and the new branding opportunities that MOOCs give the top universities to finally, for that doesn't change in the top 25 very often, but I think we come back in 20 years and I think this is going to change the order of the schools in the top 25. See, see, Chuck's addressing universities. Let's talk about professors here for a second. You know, when I was at West Virginia, you got from West by God, Virginia. Uh, he was, you know, that guy had a wasted piece of skin. Doesn't matter, you know, see selling down waste stuff. There's a lot of professors out there that get tenure and then they don't do a whole lot after that. This is going to force people to think about where they're going with their careers. It's going to force people to think about what they're offering, what they're contributing to their student base and others around the world. The nice thing about books is you can help people all around the world. You really get rejuvenated when you get an email from Italy or an email from South Africa of somebody utilizing something from your roof and someone you would never have touched before. So while this says no job, I think there's multiple jobs, multiple opportunities for professors in the future. You have to be creatively thinking about what those opportunities are. Some might be professional assessors. Some might be counselors and tutors. Okay, you say the same thing now. Um, is, how about anybody out in the audience? Are you nervous? Is anybody nervous about this? Is anybody worried it's going to affect you? Here is a stress ball. Okay. Oh, we got some stress uh, balls. Anybody else nervous? We got some there we go. Balls. It's a stress ball. uh, these stress balls are courtesy of uh, I think you're going to get your MOOC on Netflix. 
I think we're going to all be reality stars at the end of the day. There's going to be the Moot Channel. There will, right? Yeah, so, channel. so Coursera probably is moving. I mean, if you think about it, they're gathering talent like a talent agency. They're going to use you as the people who decide who's the most funny, and then they're going to turn it on Netflix, and you're going to buy this stuff on Netflix for a buck, right? So TV dinner is exactly the right methodology there. Another thing is one of my I lost this. I, one of my students sent a picture of my lecture on their big screen TV, and he says. What I do is I download the MP4s of your lecture for Coursera, and my wife and I put it up on our Apple TV, and we sit there snuggled together with popcorn, <laughs> learning about internet history, technology, and security, right? And it's like, yeah, moves with your TV dinner. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we only got one left. If that, two left. Mourinho moves or PD moves, panic or hysteria. We can almost skip these if you want. What do you think? Well, I think Mourinho and PD are something in that. Something in that one? Yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Ah, there are 22 types of MOOCs that I've come up with so far. One of the most important, I think, is a PD MOOC for those of us in education. Any people in the field of education, field of business, medicine, any professional practices, right? Profe we, we want to come back to where we got our degrees and learn more. We, you know, or at other places. We, we want to keep up to date, right? And so a PD MOOC makes a lot of sense both from the university standpoint, the department standpoint, the professor standpoint, as well as the person out on the street who, who wants to, to keep a job, maintain a job, and so forth. Remedial, well, I think there are going to be bottleneck MOOCs to help kids who flunk calculus, who flunk the hard math courses, and don't get through engineering courses at Michigan. I think we need these courses in the summer to get those people through those bottleneck courses. I think we need both of these. I think we need both of these kind of MOOCs. Right, and I think the PD MOOC, uh, you use the example if you want to go back to your school and kind of upgrade skills. Uh, some of the people who were taking my internet history, technology, and security class, they were in the business of security. They need to take a class a year. Now, the fact that I used security in my title made it so it was okay, right? Now, they said, oh, I'm doing a security class. Now, it turns out it was just shot on a couple of really simple things. But it was good enough for them because they had to spend a certain amount of time. Now, the problem that they had was the certificates that they got from Coursera prior to the signature track were not suitable. They sounded so lame, written by a lawyer, basically. <laughs> they basically said, we don't know who you are, we don't know like, if you even exist, or, or whatever. Now, the, the signature track, I think, will make this PD move where people do need evidence of PD. Well, I think that will really open things up. I don't know how many, what fraction that is, but I think it's really important. And I'm fascinated with PD moves, and I believe that one of the things that uh, we're doing at the University of Michigan is building a new undergraduate kind of liberal arts slash technology degree. But what I want to do is I want to move some of the technology down into the high school and I want to teach high school teachers how to teach this material so our students come better prepared and then move deeper into our curriculum because I think increasingly we're going to see that the four-year degree is going to be the thing that defines a university. The research is going to continue to be there, but the four-year degree is what makes you rabid alums, people that give you money, they make a lot of money, they do all this wonderful thing. So I think we have to understand that it is our job to produce even better for your graduates. Not necessarily turn them into little robots or something, but teach them so many things, and that's why I want to push some of that stuff on them. Let's skip panic or hysteria, panic in each right. Let's, let's go on to uh, the end of this second bio. Let's get a uh, vote. And you know, you can, you can decide if you want to vote the red, the red card, if you want so yeah, you know, right. You people. I We have prizes. And soft things to throw at the audience. Yeah, so we have microphones here, and we got people, you know, wanting to ask questions. And feel free, sometimes when you come up and ask a question and you start talking, it you know, sounds like you're making a speech, you can make a speech too, right? We might stop you after a minute, but you can make a speech if you want. If you could have stayed home and watched this online, why are you here today? And 
And so I don't think we need to be afraid. You said that some of us are afraid. I don't think we need to be afraid because no matter how um, amazing what you're doing online is, people want to be with people and they want to talk face to face. And the other stuff is available, and that's great, and that's a great secondary thing. But I think um, the very fact that this conference is growing in population proves that um, we don't need to be afraid. It's all an enhancement. I completely agree with you. Uh, come pick a book. Come pick a book. All right, Brad Fuller, founder of College Plus. And I've got a follow-up to that. I really do believe we're here for community. So the question is, how do you wrap around a mood and engaging community collaboration in the physical world, face-to-face? -face? What are the emerging models for? You mentioned Flyback Professor. I think it's a little bit expensive. It is. So that it's scalable and really engaging with student. And those people are getting a book. I'll put your name on the front if you want me to sign already, but we'll put names on it to come up later. What did I say? Um, so yeah, I, I think that's important, and I, I, I think it is difficult to come up with scalable versions of that, right? It's difficult, the flyby, I, I didn't, I was, give, I was giving talks, right? We both fly a lot, we give talks all over the world, and I just do these when I'm giving, I've never flown. Um, I might go to Pakistan or something one time just to go meet a Pakistan student, just to make a video about that. But, uh, um, but it is difficult, and so it's, it, it, I do think to some degree in the millennials, if we come up with the right proxies, we'll be okay, right? And they create, uh, uh, of course, their classes have local study groups, and that's great. I think you don't need a lot of face-to-face. -face. You need to believe that face-to-face -face is possible. You've got to believe that they're real people. And I think, I think we'll get there. To get communities, you need rituals, you need membership, you need identity, you need some kind of uh, feeling of there's a purpose in, in that class. That's to go beyond the sense of getting the content. Uh, flesh and blood communities have all these things. Virtual ones have other things. I, I've written a paper of 10 aspects to building online communities that came out oh, about eight, nine years ago, and I haven't even sent it to folks. But if you if you have a T-shirt, I survived Dr. Bong's online class or MOOC, you know that builds up that builds some camaraderie among the students. Social icebreakers helps. Put posting expectations, as I said yesterday, and commitments and those kinds of things. Having little video clips of yourself and the class, memories, memories of the challenging things that happened, things you accomplished, milestones, all those things. That so, so one of the things that I do a lot is coach other faculty on how to actually record lectures. Now, I don't have to tell Kurt how to do this, right? The first thing you got to do is you got to get off your pedestal. Like, uh, there was an example of uh, Eric Rabkin taught a class in uh, uh, modern literature or something. And um, one time he had to record a lecture while he was in his cabin. And, and he, and so it was, he had, everything else was this polished studio stuff with really good lighting and all this stuff. And he was doing this kind of crappy lecture in his cabin. Halfway through the lecture, Cat walks back in the back of the, of the film, right? And sits down in view of the camera. He doesn't know this, of course. So, so what happens, the students start talking about the cat and the philosoph philosophical meaning of the cat, right? And so the point is, is the more we try to make these perfect, my math lab, robot-like experiences, the more we fail in creating community because we, the teacher, are the starting point of the community. And if we don't model a behavior of being human and being there and being real, then how are the students ever going to follow that model and become human and real? Second question. All right, my name is Stephanie Richter. I'm a dead tech doc student. And considering. Turning up for a sec. Go ahead. All right, I'm an ed tech doc student looking at MOOCs as a potential area of research for my dissertation. So what do you think is interesting about MOOCs? Completion, motivation, what, what is it that would be a good research area? Stuff that I'm learning is very good. I'm looking at in terms of MOOCs. In fact, I collected some data recently. So motivation, stuff that we're learning, why people would do uh, this on their own, what supports they're getting from it. I mean, there's a, Everything's fair game. Right. It's just like people walk in and we say, I want to research mobile. Well, what aspect of mobile? And you're asking that question. What aspect of MOOC should I be looking at? This is a longer conversation. People might look at assessment and credentialing. Other people might be looking at plagiarism and copyright issues. I think, for me, uh, the most interesting questions are one of personal volition. Why are you doing this? And what benefits are you getting from it? How have you helped other people in the class? What kind of relationships have you found, found uh, meaningful to you to help support you and sustain you within this? So, you know, I, I think the questions about self-directed learning are ones that we can then use to train teachers about uh, how, to, how to foster a whole society. So we're moving from a time when the vast majority of education, formal education, was didactic teacher center and all this, with all this open access, before it was a scarcity, now it's an abundance, 
with all this abundance of knowledge, we're going to have more and more need for self-directed learning skills. Right? Lots of lifelong learning skills. We've been talking about this forever. We need to understand self-directed learning better than we do now. DC and Ryan out of Rochester, Daniel Pink's drive book will help you on that way. Uh, take a look at some of those things, Ken Robinson's books and so forth. But that's where I would go. So, so I would say you are lucky to be alive right now. Yeah, exactly. You are lucky to be a PhD student in education. It is more fun to be a PhD student in education than it has been in the last 150 years, to right. be honest, right? Yeah. So, so, the, so, right. Um, yeah, right, right, right. And so, so the, so the thing that that I would that I would say that, that I'm most curious about actually is not so much. Uh, I mean, I, all the stuff that Kurt says is great, and that's really asking the question about MOOCs as MOOCs. What I'm more interested in is how the experience of teaching in MOOCs and the pedagogy that we derive, new pedagogy we drive because MOOCs force us to derive it, how that comes back in my classroom, right? And so I've done it enough times now, because this is my, I've done it three times now, and I'm starting to see my classroom teaching change. But uh, people could tell me, I can, I mean, I never read any book. I mean, those books are, you know, blah, 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 lots of pages of stuff, stuff, right? Stephanie, Stephanie, Stephanie. <laughs> You're fishing for an answer, there's your fish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> about how we can bring it back to the classroom and how we can enhance the on-campus experience based on the forced pedagogy we are stuck with for 50,000 people. 10 minutes? We got 10 minutes out of that. Yeah, okay. you don't have to be quiet, actually. This is not quiet. It's good. Hey, John, this is California State University, Monterey Bay. Oh, I've been there. Sue Moody, my former student, you know, Sue Moody. That's right. Well, by the way, the best PhD thesis is the finish one. Uh, <laughs> Well, we started off with these silly computer science people doing this. We were like objective skills being assessed, and they can say, hey, we learned this, right? Uh, and so the humanities kinds of MOOCs are finally emerging, and I think we're going to see more play here in the portfolio space. And, and that makes a lot of sense because we want to run the skills. We want things that we can show to potential employers about what we can do for them now. They started with the easy stuff. They started with objective things that can be assessed. Portfolio is a little more messy and harder. So, it, it makes sense where they, where they start, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. And so uh, I've heard three or four people at this conference who are developing e-portfolio kinds of tools. That last night at dinner, I was with someone doing that. So I think in a year from now, we're gonna, that might be the theme of this conference. Right, and so I'll do a plug for best, which is the data standards around the portfolio and change. I didn't even cut off. No, no, that's okay. Cutting people off is just part and parcel of this session. <laughs> so I think that what we're going to find quickly is, as people walk into a job with like this little stack of paper and say, look, hire me, see this? Yeah. What's going to happen is the employer's going to say, show me what you've done. And I think what's going to happen is that employers are going to become increasingly portfolio oriented, right? Because the piece of paper that you come and says, I went to Bloomington for seven years to get my bachelor's degree, um, that now seems to be a bare instrument enough to say you can get a job. But I believe that as we you know, break this into pieces, especially people getting a, uh, a degree in uh, comparative literature in their undergraduate, and then going to get a bunch of Coursera classes to become a computer scientist, and they go like this, I'm, I can get a $7,000 computer science job with this stack of paper from Coursera, they're gonna say, uh, show me just like something, okay? I mean, and what will happen, I think, is we'll find that the portfolio requirements that employers are going to demand are going to not be that great, right? It's not going to be like, I took 40 things and I need 80 portfolio artifacts, but some things that are more summative and more to show sort of real progress. And so I think it's going to bring, it's going to shine a harsh light on the lack of portfolios. And I do think that there's a, going to be some real great opportunities for businesses. Perhaps LinkedIn would be a good place. You know, LinkedIn is sleeping giant. They could, I don't know why LinkedIn doesn't do a better job of portfolios, right? Um, but I think it's going to shine a harsh light on it as people start walking into jobs. We can hear these, uh, these stories like, oh, I got one Ruby class and I'm making 90000 bucks a year. But that's kind of like I dropped out of campus and my college and became a billionaire. Those are apocryphal stories that somehow we think those prove the, prove the general point, which they don't. The more general point is I got 12 Coursera things, but I'm going to need something else. And I think portfolios. Uh, where are you from? Hi, I'm Alan Moore. I'm from Boston. I'm an instructional designer. I freelance, and I'm a MOOC dropout. Except I'm a reluctant MOOC dropout. What I want on the open end is an open end to the time limit, because I know that's an administrative nightmare. But 
it's going to make a world of difference to me. Okay, so that is a really good point. And, um, and, and again, it's a point that I didn't see until I did it my third time, right? So, I mean, I actually am on my fourth week. So, I taught a Coursera class that had its distinct beginning and end, and it was stressful. So, I didn't want to stress myself continuously, right? So, you have to have beginnings and end. Then I taught a Python class that had a beginning and end. And then I created a self-paced version of my Python class, right? And so, I just say, look, do you want to hang on with me? I'll be here for this 12 weeks. Take this. And if you want to just sit and, and chip away at my class, I'll still give you a badge at the end of it. Right? I'll give you a badge if you go with me, and I'll give you a badge if you don't. And I think we're going to see that. And I think um, some of the Udacity stuff is better at being self-paced. But I think we're going to find, uh, we're going to start thinking these credentials are less valuable. So we're going to start, I think, allowing more of a self-paced attack on these credentials, especially if we can sort of bolster them with portfolio work. We're now, who cared, right? I mean, and the other thing that I think is going to be interesting that we're going to find if we build really good self-paced classes, the cohort effect is what Andrew talked about yesterday, about why you want to make a cohort so there's people to help you. The cohort effect is you can get a cohort of 100 or 200 working on it together with you, right? It's not the same cohort for six months, but I think you can find, and I'm trying to experiment with peer grading in a self-paced situation. So the peer grading requires a cohort. But what if we could come up with a way that peer grading only needed like 40 other people at the same moment within a week or two in the same material? And now we've got all kinds of crazy things. And so I think you're absolutely right. I think it's something that has to be fixed. I think we're at other banks. You know, you have different kinds of CDs at different banks. You might have different kinds of boot providers, those that have open-ended with no timeline and those that are closed. We're at the beginning stages here, and I think derivatives will be coming of instead of just looking at a MOOCs, a MOOCs, a MOOCs. They're all they're all a little bit different, and I think. Look, things will emerge for tutoring and metric services and assessment services. I, I think the number one job in, in a decade is going to be someone who's a, a, a human development skills, counseling skills, in addition to a domain expertise in sociology or finance, and can understand the internet as a, as a means of learning. I think, to be honest, counseling skills are going to grow in importance, uh, and that will help the person who's kind of lost their way and dropped out of it and really would like to come back, right? Next question. We have a couple minutes left. Um, how actively do you market your moves and can you talk about strategies to make them more popular? Yeah, let's try and answer both questions quickly, Chuck. I, I am marketing my MOOC, and I'll tell you why. It's very important to market your MOOC. There's people, I have people out there still literally trying to sabotage my MOOC. They didn't like Blackboard, and then they, they tried to basically say anything they did and say. So I invited all my friends and say positive things. Uh, no, Blackboard, Blackboard had a list of 27,000 people using course sites. Blackboard wanted to help these people who are using the free tool learn how to teach. So our move was developed to help people in the world who are teaching and didn't never learn how to teach online. And we had some people showing up who had connectivistic MOOCs in the past who wanted us to be connectivistic, and that was not the mission of our move. Our move was to help skilled people to learn how to teach online, and those people went away after a week, fortunately. Uh, they were misguided. We, we made it open, let them come in. But they marketed through email to 27,000 people. We got 4,000 signed up just like that. So that, that's how often these, these and press, the press releases get out there. You don't believe, you, if, any, if anyone here wants to teach a MOOC, if you teach a MOOC, you're, you, you don't believe people coming at you, wanting to interview and all this kind of stuff. And the, right, Chuck? I mean, yep. you get the, the press is coming all the time, radio show, what the, yeah. yep. so, so, so basically, I think we've got to separate out the Coursera and edX, which they give TED Talks, right? And that's a great marketing mechanism. Uh, so I think that we shouldn't sort of look at how everyone should try to be like Coursera. So that's part of why I got Dr. Chuck online, so that I could see how many people would show up and just me promoting it. And, and this, is, this is the advice I'll give myself and the advice that I would give to you or any school that's trying to do this. And that is virality, right? And that is if you do something right, Somebody tells somebody else. And the virality has to do with if 100 people see it, how many do they tell? If they tell 90 people, you're going to drop off really fast. If they tell 110 people, it's going to go crazy exponential. So I do all kinds of things in my class. At the beginning, I say bring your friends, do all these things to try to create virality. But if the class is crap, the virality doesn't work. So I think we'll see viral adoption. And I'm not talking to millions, but I'm talking to a thousand. You might do a course, and it might have 2,000 people. If you can get 100 people to tell another 120 people, and then if that sticks, then that's great. And so we are going to all experiment with virality. 
Last question here. We got a minute left. All right, I'll talk quickly. Uh, Josh Sheridan, go ahead. Get your book, get your book, get your book. What are your thoughts on, on blended MOOCs and licensure and bringing them into the classroom? And a lot of those conversations go on the free range MOOCs, and there are a lot of students that could be low interest in this country who could benefit with additional community and, and, and supports and need the credit. And so, your thoughts on the promise of blending and the challenge of that and whatever that might have? Blending is a big issue, and I have a blended learning with a gentleman in the back. I've got the hand, so. In that handbook of blending, we have 39 chapters, and there's 39 different models of blending. Okay, and uh, so that means we totally haven't figured this out yet. And K-12 level is now struggling with this issue of blending. And, and I'm, I'm using blending right now in my class, combining face-to-face uh, -face students, online students, Google Hangouts, and Open Connect, we're doing all sorts of things. Uh, I think each situation will require a different type of blend, depending upon the type of students you have, your goals, your time. I just factor in there. If I'm in a hotel room in Manchester, I, but use something different than if I'm back at home. So, in terms of MOOCs, I think we need more research to figure out which types of blends have been effective for what type of classes, and that will take a few years. There are some researches coming out in the International Review of Research on Open and Distance Learning. It's a free journal out of Athabasca University in Canada, IRROBL. So, if you're interested, and also if you're interested in, in, in the state of MOOCs, uh, if you go to my homepage, underneath my picture on the homepage is my monster syllabus. The monster syllabus is 75 pages. We have a whole week on MOOCs. You can read what the research says on MOOCs. We have a week on uh, uh, mobile learning, a week on collaborative technology, a week on e-books, a week on e-learning. It's a 75 page. Everything's a hot book. So if you're interested in all these topics, that's, I can't answer this question for but you can explore that. I have a much shorter answer um, that does require a website. Yeah. Um, and, and, and my answer is that I think that it's natural that blended is going to happen, right? I mean, as a teacher, every time I work something out in a MOOC, I immediately want to apply it in my class, and I want to change how I use my classroom time, right? And so the blended is just going to happen. What creeps me out at this point is anybody who right now thinks monetize, 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 and whether that's a university or a startup or whatever. So people who go like, I'm going to get this MOOC, and I'm going to add this, I'm going to make some money, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make some money, and I'm going to make some money, and I'm going to make some money. It's like, that freaks me out, right? I, I, I think it's so early, and uh, those are fine experiments, but I think we shouldn't bring too much into sort of the early sort of trying to university monetize, do this, then we're going to do this other thing. Those should be thought of as experiments, not sort of new models. But the blending of MOOC resources and MOOC techniques into real classrooms, that is just going to happen. We can't stop that from happening. Okay, we got your cards. What I'd like to do is grab both cards. <coughs> both cards, red and blue. Hold them both up in the air. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think we both won. I think we both won. How many of you got some light bulbs going off from this session? How many got an idea from this session, right? Lots of stuff happening out here. He wants, he wants me to bunch them. Look at that. Um, you know, I'm going to go for three words from this session, but I think we've run out of time on, on this. But I'm, I'm curious to see you know, what you've learned from this session. I hope you got something. We've got cards and some more giveaways. We've got one book left. Um, you know, we, we'll hang around. We finish. We've got another finish to pass out and so forth. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so thank you all for attending the session. Chuck, you have a final word for folks? No, thank you all. This has been really great fun.